Well, tonight we are talking about the very last chapter in our regroup curriculum for the sake of others. There is a progression that we want you to, to move along at regroup, and it's no mystery, we don't hide it. We want you to go from being self-centered to being God-centered, and in doing so, become more others-centered. Now, we don't want you to jump right from being self-centered to other-centered. That's something that some of us do a little too well, and maybe that's why we're in regroup for codependency. This is, this is all hypothetical. So uh, we, we want you to go exactly in that order. And you need to understand our goal in regroup is not to just help you become happy, healthy, well-adjusted people who then can go about your life unrestrained by your old wounds and baggage. That's, that's wonderful. That's a really wonderful thing, and I want that for you. But it's also kind of just a little worthless to everyone else in the world who doesn't happen to be you. And you know I love you guys, right? You know that, that I just, I bleed regroup and I love you and I want the best for you, but I'll let you in on a little secret that may, may make you dislike me. I don't care to make you happy. And God doesn't care to make you happy if it's gonna ruin you in the end. God cares to make you holy because he knows that through that, you will end up being eternally happy with him as his beloved. The mission of Regroup, the mission of Summit, the mission of the church at large, none of these are about you, or, or rather, to, to say it better, it's not only about you. We've talked before about how you are a part of a larger story, and your story, the choices you make in it, affect more people than just you. You're a part of a drama that began before the time, the birth of time itself, and that will continue long after we are gone, long after time itself ends. There's a theme that you can see when you look both at the meta narrative of scripture and also its individual stories. We, we are freed from something. We see the people in scripture, they are freed from something, but they're freed for something better, for something else, for something new. When you get space, when you're able to get some sobriety, when you get some space between you and your junk, you are being freed from something, but not just to be sober. That's just the first step. You're freed from something for something else, for something better. We see this in scripture over and over. Joseph freed from slavery so he can save his family from starvation eventually. Jonah saved from the belly of the fish so that he can go to Nineveh and preach repentance to them. Queen Esther saved from poverty, from commonness, and taken to be the king's wife. And why? Just so she can enjoy the lap of luxury? Of course not, so that she can later ask for her people, Israel, to be spared from genocide. Even in the New Testament, St. Paul, we see him stoned and left for dead. And then the, 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 the believers gather around him and he is freed from death and injury, but not, not as a reward for his suffering, but rather that he can go on to Lystra, Iconium, Antioch, and preach the good news about Jesus. In God's economy, we are freed from something for something better. But to really understand this concept, I think we need some context. We need to understand what God has called us to, both as individuals and corporately as his people. Because here's the thing, there is and there will continue to be pain in our stories. And there will be pain in our stories even when we are on the right path, which can be very, very confusing. When we experience pain in our stories on the right path, because we're still living in the consequences of a fallen world, it makes us question, it makes us lose sight of what it is that the story is about. It makes us lose sight of the, of the idea that we're called into a story that's, that's about more than just us in this little bit of time that we have on earth. One of the most frequent calls in scripture is to remember, and I think this is because humans, we just have no longevity of memory. We call foul on God whenever anything goes wrong in our lives as though this one incident is the only information, the only uh, evidence we have about God's character and about how he feels about us. To simply ask why is life unfair without looking at the larger context of the story of man is like as C.S. Lewis writes, reading only half a book and then blaming the author for not resolving the plot. We have to understand the context of our own story if we hope to persevere through the challenges we will face in this story. When I was 10 years old, my mom woke up to me screaming from the kitchen where I had lit two dolls on fire on top of our stove and I was pouring grape juice onto them as they burned. <laughs> See, context matters, right? I have two irrational fears in life. Actually, I have one irrational fear in life, uh, uh, going downhill fast. And then my other fear is porcelain dolls, but I actually think that one is perfectly rational because we all know they are tiny little monsters. 
when I was growing up, um, my brother was occasionally put in charge of me. He was four years older than me. And so when, as soon as my mom would leave, he would put on movies uh, that were not safe for the little ears. And some of these were like about dolls. Uh, there was one, I think the worst one was called The Dummy. It was about this marionette puppet that like killed, you know, people uh, and other things, I guess. Um, Chucky was another one that we watched. Yes, you're nodding at me. You know what Chucky is. It's disgusting. Uh, but porcelain dolls, I think, were like the, just the pinnacle of, of fear for me because uh, they just have those little, those little fixed expressions and their little glassy eyes just staring into your soul. Um, <laughs> incidentally, my grandmother, my grandmother Mary, she was my great-grandmother, she made porcelain dolls as a hobby. Uh, so anytime that we would visit her, it was like just walking into my worst nightmare. There's, you know, like, like just an arm just sticking up straight, pointing into my soul. And then there's like eyeballs looking at you. And then you look and there's a box and it's like just unpainted heads, you know, just this is really, it was, it was awful. Uh, anytime we went there. So my grandmother, um, as a very kind gesture, uh, one Christmas made me these two beautiful elaborate porcelain dolls and, and sent them to Pittsburgh. Um, and my mom wouldn't let me throw them out because, you know, they were from my 90-year-old grandma or whatever. Um, and so I did what I could to just keep them away from me. So I put them in the furthest part of my house that I could get to, uh, just like in a closet somewhere facing the other direction. Um, and then in the night, my brother, sweet man that he was, thought that that would be fun to reposition the dolls. So he comes and he, he brings them into my room, he sets them on my night table, kind of tilted over me so it appears that they're watching me sleep. And then he like shoots a Nerf ball at me and just enjoys himself as I wake up and just freak out. And so I'm screaming, I grab the dolls by their hair, I run downstairs, I light the burner and we had like the gas burners in Pittsburgh, you know, and I throw them on there, they're, you know, they're, they're on fire. Now I know the question that you have right now, why the grape juice, Kaylee? Well, let me tell you. I was in Catholic school, and so I took the grape juice and I blessed it in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, turning it into the blood of Christ, and I then poured the blood of Christ all over the little harbingers of death. That's, <laughs> that's when my mom walked in. Context matters. Very important. To really understand, to really understand why it matters at all, why it's important for us to persevere through trial. And not just that, but to do anything for the sake of others, we have to understand salvation in the context of our larger story. We looked at this, the very first session of Regroup, this idea of the blessing of Abraham. So we're gonna revisit it tonight because it is through this lens that we have to view recovery, why we're doing it, and why God wants us to succeed at it. So if you have your Bibles, you can open up to Genesis 12 or just listen as I read. The Lord said to Abraham, go from your country, your people and your father's household to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation and I will bless you. And I will make your name great and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and whoever curses you I will curse. All peoples on earth will be blessed through you. Now let me give you some background here. This is, this is Yahweh addressing Abraham, who is selected to be the father of his chosen people, a people who are to be set apart for him alone. And up to this point in the story, God had created Adam and Eve. They fell, they, they populated the earth, and the people, God's creatures, have had a very difficult time living in harmony with him. So God chooses Abraham and his barren wife, Sarah, to be the father of his nation beyond number, to be God's special possession, his chosen people. Now that all sounds fabulous, but, but pay attention to what he says in the blessing. He says, he says Abraham will, will bring blessing to the nations. I will make your name great and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who you bless. All peoples on earth will be blessed through you. He makes it very clear that the blessing of Abraham has, has a mission behind it. It's not just for Abraham to be blessed, it's that through him, the entire world might come into covenant relationship with God. They are freed from barrenness. They're able to conceive a child, but they are freed for bringing blessing to the entire world. For us to understand and give meaning to our own lives, it's imperative that we understand this. It's not just about us. It's not just about our lives. The relationship that Israel had to God was one of mission, not privilege. Listen, the, the whole point of him selecting Israel as his chosen people was to make them a display nation. 
He wanted them to, to, to be seen by the world, to live lives so full of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, faithfulness, that, that the rest of the world looked at them and wanted to know the God they lived that way for. That's the whole mission of Israel, for us to be so attractive that it makes other people curious about God that people would see us, see our transformation, see our beauty, and become curious about our God. We are freed not just for ourselves, but for the sake of others, for the sake of everyone else. And this mission that Israel struggled to fulfill was accomplished in the person of Jesus Christ and handed off to us, you and I, his church, in this period of time, this little pocket of eternity, the already not yet. God has already begun the consummation, but it is not yet completed. God is coming back, but in his grace, he delays. And he doesn't delay to punish us, and he doesn't delay so that, so that we just have to just continue the drudgery. He delays so that we have a little bit more time, so that we can get home and bring as many people with us as we possibly can. You understand what I'm saying to you? That means that God has hand-selected you He's chosen you. He, he has indwelt you with his spirit. He's given you his power. And he expects something from you. He's chosen you. He's given you this mission to help rescue the rest of his scattered flock. And this is an unprecedented blessing, but it's also an enormous responsibility because what it means is that your sin or your obedience unto God will never again affect only you. My brother said his first curse word when he was three years old. Uh, my parents met on Halloween of 1976 while they were both working at a bar called The Cove in Geneva on the Lake, Ohio. And uh, my mom was dressed as Medusa, which meant like, you know, bikini top and pipe cleaners in her hair. Um, and my dad, who had been kind of relegated to the not popular part of the bar, was irritated because he wanted to make more money. And so he like devised this plan to get back at my mom uh, for the situation, which wasn't really under her control anyway. Uh, and so he, you know, devised this plan to like woo her and then break her heart. And I don't think it worked very well because a year later they had my brother Jason uh, and got married. So anyway, uh, I tell you this history about how my parents uh, met so that you might have an idea of how he came to know a curse word at such a tender young age. So three years later, sweet little Jason sitting in the back seat trying to get his shoe on and he's in his car seat. And I don't know if you've ever seen a baby try to put a shoe on. It's adorable, but it's really hard for them because they have not a lot of manual dexterity and he's in the car seat. So he's strapped in there and he just can't reach it. And he's like, <laughs> so finally he just takes the shoe and he chucks it at the dashboard and he's like, Ethan shoe. <laughs> and my parents are like, oh, where did he learn that word? Well, he learned it from them. <laughs> he learned it from them and maybe they didn't mean to teach it to him. But in all those little in-between moments, when, when they didn't know he was listening, he learned it all the same. Your sin will affect other people. It will affect other people, maybe not right now, maybe not tonight, but eventually, inevitably, it will. You know, you, you might not think that looking at porn affects anybody else, but tell that to your wife as your marriage grows cold under the weight of those expectations. You may not think that, that, that flirting with that married guy affects anyone besides you, but tell that to his spouse who, who, who feels in her heart that she is no longer the primary object of his affection. You might not think that your gossip affects anybody else, but tell that to the child who is now tormented at school because everyone knows his daddy's in jail. Or the woman who is lonely because that tiny seed of gossip that was sown among her friends has caused all of them to turn away from her. Your sin whether large or small or outward or inward, it will affect other people, but in the same way, your obedience will affect other people. My sponsor, Bethany, had like 27 kids and a, and a house and a husband, and it was no uh, mystery to me that she was fitting me in um, between really a really busy life when she could have been doing something that was actually fun for her, um, but her time with me changed my life. You might not think that how you talk to your kids really matters, but tell that to, to your daughter who chooses to abstain because she has a strong sense of self-worth as a direct result of your praise. You might not think that, that, that reading your Bible actually matters, but tell that to your friend who is struggling and who just needs to hear some truth and to whom you are able to whisper verbatim the promises of God. Your obedience will affect other people and as a result, the success of our mission, of your mission, of our mission together for God, 
is inseparably dependent upon it. This is not a mission we've invented at Regroup. This is the mission of, of Israel given by God, accomplished by Christ, commissioned unto us the church so that we can draw as many people into the fold of grace as we can while there is yet time to choose him. Do you understand? We don't have all the time in the world. Time's running out. And, and, and God will come back. He will return like a thief in the night. We don't know when it's going to happen. There's a small amount of time that we have to invite people to know him, to invite people to understand that there is something better than just this. You are the light of the world. And you can put that light, you, you can take that light and put a bushel over it, or you can let it shine before men so that they see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. And listen, I know that you think that you're not good enough. I know that you think that, that you're not good enough to lead other people because of all the stuff that you did, but listen, you're wrong. The moment that you chose repentance, the moment you chose repentance and obedience to God, he was able to use you. And the fact of the matter is you already are leading other people. You're doing it whether you realize it or not because every interaction that we have with another human being has the power to point them toward Christ or away from him, whether we want that power or not. And there's comfort here because, listen, we don't, we're not making disciples of ourselves. We're making disciples of Jesus. So you don't have to be afraid of your past. You don't have to hide all the terrible things you've done because the very depth of your depravity serves only to illuminate the full significance of what Christ has done for you. It serves to demonstrate the power of a God who transforms attitudes, habits, even desires of old sinners like us. There are still people in this world who don't know that they matter to God. There are still people who don't know they're loved. There's still people who don't know that they can be forgiven. There's still people who don't know that they can find joy again, who don't know that they can be freed from the things to which they are currently in bondage. They desperately need Jesus, and you are his conduit. You are his plan A. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come, the old has gone, the new is here. All this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. We love that verse, I think, because it reminds us that we're made new, that we're free in Christ, but we pay less attention to that second half that we are in fact Christ's ambassadors as though God were making his appeal through us. So if you've experienced any healing here, any success, any freedom, know that, that this is the mission that you've experienced that freedom for. That you are freed from your bondage, but you are freed for God making his appeal through you. I don't know what that mission will look like for you specifically, I know that one of the reasons I was freed up from the patterns of sexual sin and self-sabotage in my life is so that I could be here, particularly talking to women who are going through the same ebb and flow of obedience, not understanding why they continue to make the choices they make, feeling like used goods, feeling like they can never change. I feel like God has given me the grace of being living, breathing proof that that's not true. That's part of what I've been freed for. What have you been freed for? What are you free for? If you've never spent any time with this question, your homework as our last curriculum teaching of the season is to get alone this week, open your journal, and start to write. Start to write in the presence of God about what you've been freed from, what you're passionate about, and where these things intersect with a need for people in this lost and broken, confusing world. Ask God to show you, and then ask him to bless it. Not because we deserve his blessing, but because it's not about us, and we can make this petition on behalf of his character and his desire to see the world put to rights. What have you been freed for? There are people in our church who are hurting right now, who are confused by the choices they're making, and they just need someone who's a little bit further down the road to point them in the right direction. What are you going to do about it? What are you going to do about it? And if not you, who? Because here's the thing. By virtue of being in this room right now, you have self-selected 
compassion and insight and healing. If God would not send you as his conduit into the world, then who? God will accomplish his purpose will accomplish his purposes with or without us. But make no mistake, the full potency of joy and life abundant that is available to us who serve him cannot be fully experienced until that joy flows out of us into another human being. If we do nothing, if we insulate our healthier selves from those who are still hurting, it's not just others who miss out, it's us too. So my my hope for you tonight as we conclude this curriculum cycle is that you will take your next right step. Maybe that's sponsoring someone in regroup. Maybe that's leading a group. Maybe it's having coffee with someone who's hurting. Maybe it's a connect group. Maybe it's asking someone to come with you next week to the group time. Maybe it's just being honest with the people who you meet about where you've come from and where you are now so that they can see and experience this transformation taking place in your heart and they will become curious about your God. You are God's plan A for somebody. And much joy will come to them and to you when you surrender to that plan. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you. Not only that you have saved us from ourselves, but that you have called us into a mission that is so much greater than the things that we have chased after. Lord, we're grateful. Help us to remember, even as we experience the consequences of living in a fallen world, even when everything seems to be going wrong, even when we just can't make things work. Help us to remember that that is not evidence of a lack of love. Lord, help us to remember that we are your plan A for people who don't yet know that they're loved, that they can be forgiven, that there is hope. Help us to begin to take hold of that vision Help us to approach you with curiosity and humility and ask you how it is we can take part in it. Lord, give us that insight and bless us as we continue to take steps of obedience. And we pray all of this in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, in whom we put our hope. Amen.